Hello. Today I chat with Carl Friston, who is a computational neuroscientist, one of the most cited researchers of all time. And we chat about his free energy principle, which is has been likened to natural selection as these deeply fundamental principles and ideas to understand how reality works and how it evolves. So I, Carl is this amazing polymath, and we go all the way from the Big Bang through to the future of artificial intelligence. And so I hope you listen and check out this episode in order to understand a deeply fundamental principle, the free energy principle, for how life works and how to kind of see the matrix for what is actually uh, occurring in reality. Okay, thanks and enjoy. Hello, listeners. My name is Reese Lindmark. I'm the founder of Root, and welcome to The Reese Show. I believe this century is a turning point in human history, and I'm here to help you navigate it. To do so, we'll demystify the hidden but crucial ideas that you can't find anywhere else. And by understanding these transformational changes in science, technology, and society, and how to apply those ideas to your daily life, I hope to turn you into an active participant in collectively building our solar punk future. So with that in mind, today, I'm excited to chat with Carl Friston. Carl is a theoretical neuroscientist and a professor at University College London. He's this amazing polymath who is one of the most cited researchers of all time. Carl, thanks for being on the show and welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're excited to dive in. And and I've essentially been free energy principle pilled <laughs> in the last kind of week or so. Um, I've had folks, you've had folks on the podcast like Andy Clark before talking about predictive processing, but now I've kind of taken it one step further and fallen further down the rabbit hole and understanding one of Carl's crucial ideas, this kind of you know free energy principle. You've done a lot of work on brains um, and now you're kind of you know, this, this idea of the free energy principle, some people have described it as the most crucial idea since Darwin's natural selection, which is a, a, a high praise. So with that as kind of a background, and before I kind of give an overview on, on some other things we're going to chat about, could you just for our listeners, Carl, explain what is the free energy principle? What is active inference? Um, and how does it apply to our daily life? Well, if you've had Andy on uh, describing predictive processing, I think that's a very nice entree into what um, the free energy principle is about. It, it's essentially a an attempt to provide a method or a principle of the kind that you would find in physics that would be fit for purpose to un- understand and explain sentient behaviour. And of course, the kind of sentient behavior we're talking about is exactly what Andy was talking about in terms of the predictive brain, the brain as a a statistical organ that's predicting, trying to make sense of its data, and then planning and choosing the best way then to go and secure some more data. Uh, So that's the agenda. It's essentially to understand ourselves and how we make sense of our sensations, but to do so in a way you can write it down in terms of equations that you can put onto a computer with the agenda then of simulating this kind of sentience and building little artifacts, um, trying to understand broken brains, uh, make uh, more efficient computing devices. But of course, to do that, you really have to become an engineer and a physicist to, you know, to understand the basic fundamentals. So that's the agenda. Um, I could go on and explain the technical foundations of it, but perhaps we should save that for your exactly. more probing questions later on. Exactly. That's great. Yeah. And I think um, as and this is a beautiful part of, of Carl's work is that and I, you know, they just released Carl along with two other co-authors just released this book on active inference and um, a week ago. And so I kind of sped read it over the weekend and it is um, it's good, but it's it's got those formalisms, the mathematics in it. So it's kind of cool to hear these kind of crucial ideas that do apply for everything, but are like connected to formal mathematics that you could actually simulate and code up in a computer. So with that said, let me let me kind of um, give you and and our listeners some context here for for why I want to touch on the free energy principle. And you talked about it in this crucial way as this like understanding of sentient behavior. And so, you know, for me right now, I'm writing this book on what information wants, which looks at how genes kind of created the tree of life and how memes created this tree of ideas. And the free energy principle is, you know, 
you know, so so my book takes this like kind of big history perspective um, on understanding kind of sentient behavior and kind of how these ideas replicate and things like that. And so I want to kind of look at, you know, understanding the free energy principles, kind of like touching it from uh, the blind men touching the elephant where you're like, what does it look like from this perspective and this perspective? And so we're going to take maybe five perspectives today to kind of look at it. The first is this kind of information um, how information flowed in the universe before replicators, before genes and memes. Um, and we'll look at like whether the free energy principle applies to the sun, for example. And then we'll kind of go into life and biology and genes and looking at how the free energy principle applies to like the pre-brain organisms, like in the RNA soup, well, you know, what was the free energy principle doing there? And then finally, you know, with memes, thinking about both the brain and you know, what the free energy principle has to say about the kinds of information that can live in our minds. And then also more generally about human society is something like, you know, these weird like myths that we, you know, organize around like Christianity. Does that apply or, or abide by the free energy principle? And then finally, finally, we'll look at uh, machine learning and AI and kind of the combination between free energy principle and, um, and that. So that's kind of what we're going to do uh, to give you an overview, Carl. And with that, let's start with the beginning here with the information pre-replicators. So does the free energy principle, it's an understanding of sentient behavior, does something like the sun comply with it? Or, or how, how does it, the sun is stable, but it doesn't model the environment. How do you think about the free energy principle pre-sentient life? Right. So we're going to do everything, aren't we? So we're starting we at the beginning, which is, which exactly. is excellent. Yeah. Um, so there is actually a deep connection between um, the sun and replication um, in the very simple sense that the sun replicates its position um, in the sense that it orbits you know, around its centre, whatever that is, and of course we orbit around the sun. So I use the words orbit or the word orbit deliberately here because that's something that's quite fundamental to the kind of dynamics that we want to understand. Um, so everything that exists essentially has this aspect that it keeps revisiting states that it has once been in. So whether we're talking about the orbits of heavenly bodies uh, or whether we're talking about the beating of my heart or whether we're talking about my annual cycle as I look forward to Easter and my birthday and Christmas, or whether talking about biorhythms more generally, right down to the fast fluctuations and uh, electrochemical potentials in one neuron in one part of my hippocampus. At every temporal scale, at every level, we have this fundamental dynamic where you keep coming back to where you started, not unlike a sort of strange loop. So this is something that is quite crucial and possibly even definitional of things that exist. They re-keep their states of being within a limited set. So by definition, they have to keep on returning to a place in some abstract state space that they once occupied. So the free energy principle is then um, in the game of saying, well, if things exist, in the sense that they keep returning to what's technically called an attracting set of states. For the sun, it's a very simple, well, for the earth, say, it's a very simple um, set of states. It's just that your know, positions on the orbit around uh, uh, that it pursues. So the free energy principle then is, is in the game of trying to understand what dynamical properties must systems possess if they have this um, natural characteristic but also quite remarkable characteristic that they don't diverge exponentially, they don't dissipate, they don't decay, uh, they don't diffuse into nothing, that they keep themselves to within a restricted set of states, if you like, a sort of generalised homeostasis. So everything that you want to know about the free energy principle can simply be derived from saying, well, how must systems flow what kind of dynamics do systems possess if they also possess this, this, um, these attracting, um, these attracting sets or these orbits, if you like? Um, yeah. Now, can I pause you for a second, actually? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that love that, and I think it's yeah, it's super connected. I've heard some people describe the free energy principle as you know, if you think about natural selection and survival of the fittest. But then you're like, oh, wait, it's actually a survival of the stable, you know, so you have to have these stable things. And in order to be stable, then, yeah, you have, um, 
you have to be orbiting around some kind of um, attractor set. And I think, you know, for me in trying to understand the free energy principle, that visual was so crucial for me is just thinking about, you know, like ourselves as beings in non-equilibrium steady states that are kind of, you know, walking around something, you know, for, for a fish, it's good for the fish to be mostly in water most of the time. So it can't like go crazy off somewhere else or like, for me, I like being in cities and like, you know, taking showers and eating food or whatever. And so like, I'm not just, but something like the sun, I think is, is more difficult because it's, it's less of a non-equilibrium steady state. And it's also the sun doesn't have a model of its environment. And I feel like the model of its environment is a crucial part of free energy principle. So tell me how the sun does that, you know? <laughs> yep. Right. Well, in fact, the sun doesn't probably. Um, and there's a, so that's a really excellent question that, you know, so what differentiates something that could be described i mean clearly the sun's not inert but in the sense of having an active role in the way that it behaves it has a certain inanimacy so i think there's a key distinction between things that exist that keep revisiting exist you know pre-existing states that are animate and inanimate and what you're asking is what differentiates um the you know, inanimate from animate kinds um, before i sort of drill down on that i just wanted to pick up on the on the you know the lovely connections with evolution and you know just using the word replicator you know uh using the notion of replication immediately talks about this this, this sort of cyclical this solenoidal just a life cycle is another statement of this fundamental orbital nature so many people would would actually say it is not it is not survival of the fittest that is the best way to understand evolution it's just what things persist for long periods of time so it is that persistence that sort of existence in perpetuity for extended periods of time that has this sort of uh, stability and interestingly just one final little thing um of course the mathematics of what we are talking about uh, the, the mathematical definition of a non-equilibrium system or a far from equilibrium system would require it to have a solenoidal flow. And what is solenoidal flow in evolution? Well, it's red queen dynamics. It's a sort of, you know, pr say predator prey like relationship. Again, these continual cycles where you have this you know, itinerancy that has this orbital orbital aspect. So you know, this dynamic is quite fundamental at every level. I'm sure it'll 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 appear also in terms of memes that, that persist at a, at a different level of now. So let's come back to this um, key question um, of particular or natural kinds that that do and do not have or look as if they behave as if they have uh, some predictive capacity. So they're, they're doing some predictive processing or they're engaging in some kind of active inference. I think the first thing to um, uh, to say is, well, OK, we, we've defined the kind of system that um, that we want to talk about in that it has orbits. It has an itinerancy um, and it occupies a small number of states that it could occupy, very much like the fish always being in water as opposed to on the streets of New York. Then, um, But we've got to do a, a little bit more heavy lifting here, a little bit more work, because, you know, as soon as you talk about something, you have to be able to distinguish the states of the thing you're talking about from the states of everything else. So, you know, I have to be able to identify the states of the earth, the position of the earth and the position of the states of the sun, for example. I have to be able to di distinguish or disambiguate your states from my states or my states from the rest of the world. That introduces this notion of a, of a Markov blanket, which is central to the free energy principle. So on one reading, you could look at the free energy principle just as a rehash of quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, statistical mechanics, it, it, they're, they're all they all inherit from exactly the same assumptions, um, with one exception that the free energy principle just puts a Markov blanket into the mix, and that just enables you to separate the states that are internal to something relative to what's outside and it's that sort of distinction which brings the notion of prediction and information into the game because now you've got a distinction between the inside and the outside where the inside and outside states are separated by blanket states at the surface of the sun on the surface of a cell or your surface or all your sensory and active states um, then you can now talk about the inside having beliefs of a mathematical subpersonal sort 
or statistical um, correspondences with the outside. And you can now talk in, a, in terms of information theory about the inside holding some information or having information about the outside because you've got this sort of um, exchange across the Markov blanket. Um, I introduced the notion of an, a Markov blanket because I have to do that in order to answer your question about the difference between um, the sun and you. Um, the, the difference um, technically is just that the sun doesn't have what's called active states. It, you know, it doesn't have any way of its deep states. Let's think about a stone, for example, um, as you know, something that certainly exists. It's got a, uh, it's got a Markov blanket or blanket states, the surface of the stone. Uh, you can separate the surface of the stone from uh, um, everything else, and it's got some deep internal states. But the key difference between me and a stone is that my internal states express themselves through the blanket they they express themselves um, from the inside out and therefore you can see me behave in a way that looks as if i'm planning i have um a, you know uh, 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 beliefs about what's going to happen to me that i'm fulfilling um, i'm acting in a purposeful way and it may look indeed as if i'm acting in a mindful way simply because uh, the my active states are now um, in a position to affect the outside again. So one simple observation that discriminates a stone from you or a stone from any animate biotic uh, system is that you move. You know, uh, so it is as simple as that, that you can move in an autonomous way Whereas stones and planets, they certainly move, but in a frame of reference which is, you know, has no autonomous aspect to it. They, you know, they, they, they don't change their shape. They're not shape shifting in the same way that we are. And of course, if we can move, we become animate and we can influence the outside states, the external states, in a way that makes them more predictable basically um you know i'm using that word because you can link that now to andy's formulation yeah. you know we are all predictive processing machines um uh, and of course if we're if we're good at predictive processing we must be able to engineer the kinds of environment that deliver sensory signals onto our markov blanket that can be predicted and you can get into all sorts of interesting um arguments about niche construction or just being um um just uh the raison d'etre for things like language that we both share that makes you and i mutually predictable and that's how we work but because we couldn't engage in that exchange and leverage that predictability unless we were able to talk and move so you won't see the sun talking to you in in the kind of way that we're that we're talking i hope there may be a future in which you know the sun gets it's you know the, the, the classic um image of the sun being a like a smiling thing and saying hi good morning you know like we'll have to engineer that into the sun rather than it being natural so i think that your description there makes sense and what i'm hearing there just to reflect it is that yeah that we have these active states that allow us to move and allow us to model and then kind of inter interact in the environment and, and one way that i think about it kind of and, and correct me if i'm wrong here is like there are kind of certain things that can be stable and that can rotate around either non-equilibrium or kind of orbital states in the world and, and we label those things objects like sun or a cat or a rock or humans. And, and there are a lot of those things that are kind of animate. And, and in order to be animate, you have to go through this weird like non-equilibrium world. And you're kind of you have to have these active states in order to get more energy, in order to model the world, not just to, to dissipate. But then there's these kind of inanimate ones. And those ones you can kind of think of it as like the laws of physics have allowed for a certain set of things to exist that are kind of you know the sun just like i'm kind of fit with niche construction you know like a like a fish is fit for its environment so too is the sun kind of fit with the laws of physics in that it can be there's a certain set of stable things that can exist aka a bunch of hydrogen atoms getting together you know exploding making heat you know getting in gravity there rotating around and being a sun and that there's kind of a certain kind of environmental niche that exists that doesn't require active states, doesn't require modeling in the environment, but is just like an inanimate thing that can exist 
based off of the uh, the laws of the of physics. Is that kind of what? What do you think about that reflection? No, I think that's a, a great picture, um, and it's particularly um, astute because it speaks to this sort of separation of of scales, both in space and in time. Um, so one way that um, some people including myself think of things is that you you know as you go from the very very small from the quantum to the um the very very big so we're talking about sort of um you know cosmology and suns and planets and the like then there is a a, a natural progression from very random behavior to much more precise behavior um, and as it, you get more and more precise and you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you actually lose a degree of itinerancy that characterizes you and me. I mean, we are certainly um, I, you know, characterized by biorhythms and uh, all sorts of fluctuations. But the kinds of orbits that we enjoy um, are have an itinerancy. They have a sort of complexity, which is not characteristic of the orbit of the moon, for example. And that may well simply be um, that very, very big things don't have the kind of uh, itinerancy that we associate with biotic systems. So it may well be that um, you know, where things like us are, are certainly much, much bigger than the quantum scale, because at the quantum scale, then random fluctuations would um, effectively diffuse or um, disperse or mask any of this sort of solenoidal orbital behavior. Uh, but we're small enough still to have this kind of itinerancy. Um, and we only have that itinerancy in virtue of the fact we live in a nice stable world where the moon goes around the sun, around the earth, and the earth goes around the sun, and everything, uh, everything is sufficiently stable over very long periods of time. So, you know, the, 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 seeing things in that kind of context, I think, is absolutely essential. It is only because we have this slow, predictable orbits of the heavenly bodies that are changing the, the context on the surface of the Earth that provides a simple context in which we can now allow, say, evolution, or evolution can now emerge, um, and that being a very slow dynamical process that contextualizes the evolution of phenotypes. And those phenotypes now can learn. And what do they learn? They learn how to predict and they can predict uh, all the way down to you know, uh, the, the, the machinery you need to do that prediction, which is basically our brain cells doing that. So everything at the finest scale rests upon the right context established by the slower uh, more persistent, but still solenoidal, still uh, orbiting at scale above. But of course, it's true the other way around. You know, you you you, you don't get the emergence of uh, um, of species, or you don't get evolution unless you have the right kind of phenotype. And you don't have the right kind of phenotype unless it's got the right kind of brain. And you don't have the right kind of brain unless you've got the right kind of neuron. So at every level, this this sort of itinerant orbiting this. Um, uh, persistence in uh, terms of the the dynamics that enable the system to retain or remain in its attracting states depends upon the scale uh, scale above. So that's a re- I think a really really important point. You know, yeah. The free energy principle cannot apply at any single level. It has to accommodate all of those levels. I love that. I think I think I love that, and I love it as kind of like when people talk about the Goldilocks um, position for for Earth. It's like, oh, we're like not too hot, not too cold, and that's true. But there's a more kind of there's a Goldilocks position of scale, and there's a Goldilocks position of um, randomness versus stability. You know, and so just like there's a lot of special things that need to occur for us to be able to have replicators that can can like learn about the environment and the environment's not being too crazy but it's also not being too stable so yeah that's that's really interesting let's let's kind of take that and move into um moving forward in time from you know the big bang time to now um you know we're starting to get life you know we're starting to get um you know genes and and biology how do you the first question actually is how do you think about the free energy principle this is an abstract question but (laughs) how do you think about the free energy principle as compared to something like the principles of natural selection and evolution? How do they relate to each other? 
which is more fundamental? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they're both the same. So that I, that's an easy question to answer. So that, that, that's okay. Um, and even easier for me to answer in the context of our last exchange about sort of you know how one free energy minimizing process is nested within a slower um, higher uh, temporal and spatial scale. Um, so technically, how I literally think about and how I would sort of articulate this mathematically is that I would um, write down evolutionary dynamics, um, natural selection, as a process of what's called Bayesian model selection. Now, Bayesian model selection is just a um, a description of what a statistician would do if given a particular statistical model of some empirical experimental data, um, he or she had to optimize the structure of that model, say, delete a particular parameter from the model or remove um, uh, you know, um, a latent state from, from the model. Or if you're in, say, machine learning, it would be uh, um, add an extra layer to your variation or to encoder or remove one or switch out some sort of you know, um, um, rectified linear function for some sigmoid function. So it's structural attributes of anything that can be read as a model. Um, then the process of selecting the right model is simply to find the model that has the um, the greatest or maximizes the probability of the data that it is trying to model. That's known as Bayesian model evidence, aka or also known as marginal likelihood. Um, and the free energy just is a proxy or an approximation to that marginal likelihood, the negative mar marginal likelihood. And indeed, in machine learning, it's actually known as an evidence lower bound, so a bound approximation to the model evidence. The evidence that this um, these data, or the likelihood that these data could have been generated by this model. So if you now think about the likelihood of sensory exchanges in the environment being a measure of adaptive fitness, what you're effectively saying is that natural selection is just nature's Bayesian model selection of the generative models, namely the phenotypes, that have the most likely exchange that I'm going to find when sampling a phenotype at random. I'm going to find uh, this phenotype uh, characterized by its sensory exchanges with, with this eco niche. So from my perspective, uh, evolution just is an instance of um, this fundamental imperative to um, to maximize uh, the uh, the marginal likelihood of the thing as characterized by the states it occupies or the sensory exchanges. If I was uh, an evolutionary or theoretical biologist, I would call this adaptive fitness. Um, so negative free energy just is adaptive fitness when you take a phenotype and you evaluate the likelihood of its sensory exchanges over its lifetime. And then if it's good at what it does, and uh, it will persist, and it will persist in virtue of the fact that natural selection, the Bayesian, the statistician, the, you know, the, the, the great statistician comes along and says, yes, I like that kind of phenotype, that sort of model, because there's more of them, because they persist, therefore they're going to replicate in the next generation. So, you know, natural selection uh, is, 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 for me, a beautiful instance of um, the free energy principle in action, but qualified with reference to what we were just talking about. This is, you know, in the context of understanding the coupling between different sort of free energy minimizing processes, you know, the evolutionary process and the phenotypic or, you know, the ontological process, where they both have to talk to each other. And, uh, you know, and that's really the interesting issue is how does the, you know, the predictive um, phenotype um, um, get selected and how does evolution recognize the, uh, the predictive phenotype in a way that is consistent with the free energy principle. Cool. Yeah, I love that. I think that, yeah, Mike, uh, it makes me think of this idea of the library of Mendel um, from like Daniel Dennett's style books where it's like, oh, there's all these different um, DNA strands that could exist. And then only a certain subset of those books, you know, that library do actually exist, humans and cats and insects and whatever. And so we're kind of choosing a subset of those organisms or those like DNA sequences that exist. But another way to frame that is it's actually 
the library of um, Bayesian models. Um, you know, it, like it's a library of like generative models where you're like, okay, there's a whole lot of generative models that can exist in the world, but only some of them are fit with the environment with that kind of multi-scale Goldilocks moment. And so it's like, okay, we've chosen these generative models and evolution, natural selection is a way of kind of surfacing those generative models within that big old library that actually fit with the environment such that they can do good sensory things such that they can repeat themselves over time. Um, so yeah, that makes sense. Do you think that there's a, um, you know, thinking about other uh, biology and free energy principle stuff, I think that like, I kind of get the the brain version of free energy principle where it's like, okay, humans and cats, blah, blah, blah. We got these kind of models of the environment. But what about like at the start of life when you have the RNA soup and you have these like RNA replicators doing their things, you know, and then, oh, replication exists. And that's a huge moment in, in universal um, time where you have things actually replicating, producing themselves in this primordial soup. Does is the free energy principle at play there, or how is it at play when like does like the RNA have a model of its environment, but it doesn't have a brain? So t tell me about that. Right, um, you've been talking to somebody like Mike Levin, haven't you? I, I uh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll just reiterate what he would. Uh, no, he wouldn't say this because he, he he's got a, a beautiful lexicon uh, and is fluent in using it. But I'm going to say what he would say, but in maths. Um, great. <laughs> so yeah, a, a great yeah, a great question. Um, so I think that you know. The principles that we're talking about is just the principles, you know, the existential imperatives and the principles of things that self-organize to enable them to persist by returning to their attracting set. So this has to hold for a thermostat. It has to hold for a single cell organism. Um, so let's take the single cell. I think that's a really nice example. It's a particular scale. We could talk about molecules. We could go up to, to brains. But let's talk about uh, a single cell. So I think it's nice that you introduce the notion of sort of RNA and DNA as basically um, nature's specification of the structure of a generative model. Because I think that's exactly it. In fact, you can simulate that quite easily. You can just say, well, this, this is the prescription for this phenotype's generative model. And this generative model is apt to fit and exchange and explore um, this particular eco niche. So, if I'm a cell, I will have a particular organ I live in, or a particular um, um, medium um, with the right kinds of nutrients that I will I will seek out if I am sufficiently active. So, the single cell, equipped with, if you like, at its beginning, um, a scaffolding, uh, a specification of the structure in terms of its DNA. Um, the, the most important thing it has to do is to establish its Markov blanket. It has to be able to maintain um, autopoetically uh, its integrity by maintaining its Markov blanket. It's the, you know, the surface of the cell that stops it um, um, dissolving and dissipating into, uh, into its milieu. So even all the electrochemical uh, intracellular processes that are in response to cell surface receptors and the expression of active states, say the actin filaments, actin filaments of a cell, which supply it with a motility um, that could you know, be mediated just by movements and morphogenesis or changes in the shape of the cell, or it could be have little flagella. Uh, you know, little little wings that allow it to uh, to move around. Um, then. That are uh, that 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 sort of genetic and epigenetic specification of the morphology of the Markov blanket and how that Markov blanket, the surface of the sensory states, are underwritten by active states, which cause the right kind of movement that maintains the integrity of the cell. These are all just expressions of um, the this. Um, variational principle least action that just is the, the, the free energy principle what would that look like well if it was quite a sophisticated little cell it would start swimming around where would it swim to well it would swim to those environmental states um, that were consistent with the integrity of its markov blanket that enabled it to swim so that would look like chemotaxis it would look as if it was searching out or at least it was moving when it was um in you know a concentration um, that was either too high or too low in relation to its Goldilocks, its prior prior preferences encoded by the DNA. What would happen if a bunch of these cells got together? Well, then we move now to um, multicellular uh, behavior, and things get a little bit more interesting now. Uh, um, you know, Mike Levin tells a lovely story here because you know there's something slightly paradoxical about uh, multicellular 
um, collectives in the sense that the the surface cells uh, have to sacrifice their ability to replicate. So it's you know it's almost sort of anti-evolution, but collectively, of course, they're main, just maintaining their Markov blanket. They're just persisting in you know in the right kind of way that evolution likes. Uh, but now the what used to be uh, a Markov blanket with its internal external states is now internal to the surface of a multicellular structure. So now again we're coming back to this. Um, nesting aspects. We've got blankets of blankets. Um, so blanket building that you know, underwrites integrity of a um, an organelle or a macromolecule structure um, that then underwrites the integrity of a cellular Markov blanket that then underwrites the blanket building capacity of a collection of cells that ultimately grows into a phenotype and a creature and possibly even a society and a species. Uh, so at every level you are, if you like, um, appealing to the same principles, but you can see immediately how something can sort of uh, uh, something's behaviour can be evolve or become more and more sophisticated and much uh, more structured in its apparent capacity to plan and to respond adaptively in uh, very particular ways from a little thermostat through to something like you and me, or perhaps even beyond, through to our favourite political parties or countries or yeah. uh, our cultures. Which we'll get to in a second. But yeah, so that, I think that makes sense to me. And I think that there's a, well, A, I love this idea of like, you know, natural selection kind of choosing, it It needs um, Markov blankets in order to exist. And so it's like, you know, those, and those things, those blankets, whether it's, you know, lipid layers at, you know, at, at very early times or later with like skin cells and stuff, it's like you need the, or the, the thing itself needs to be able to create that Markov blanket in order to have these internal and external states. And so then, and those ones like sacrifice themselves for the good of the whole organism, for the good of the whole. Th so that makes some sense to me. Just think about like the kinds of things that will naturally evolve on any planet. It's like, you'd want, you'd expect Markov blanks, blankets to evolve wherever. Um, and then the other piece that you said there, which is interesting, yeah, it's like, yeah, these little kind of, you know, pre, you know, like, you know, you know, uh, you know, survival of the fittest chemical reaction time, you know, the the very beginning of, 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 of life. Yeah, it's not like they have models, but they do have these, yeah, they have these, they have, they have, they have generative models that are not like our brains and can't do planning, but, but are, can be in the present and can follow these chemo taxis. So I think, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Do you think, you know, kind of transitioning now into, um, getting closer to humans and brains will kind of, you know, be in between full on memes um, and, and genes with just talking about our brains. So one way I think about this is we have this, there's this idea of what information wants and the kinds of, you know, ideas that can replicate from mind to mind. And when they replicate from mind to mind, they have to have a home in our minds. And so something like dun, 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 um, can live within our phonological loop, you know, this little piece of our mind that can kind of like hold audio signals or whatever. Um, and you know so much more about the brain than I do, so much more. Like one could not even say how much more you know. So, but how, so how do you think about um, what kinds of information can replicate to live in our minds? Like what are the kind of homes that exist in our minds and what information would you expect to replicate and, and be stored and be fit for our brains? Like if, if our brain was an evolutionary niche, what information yeah. fits there? Right, so you've introduced two really important themes, which I know are close to your heart. Uh, so I'm just going to unpack them from my perspective. The first one um, is the difference between um, um, something like a chemotactic um, cell that looks purposeful. It's swimming up the right kinds of concentration gradients. And you, when you go on Google or Wikipedia trying to sate your knowledge, your curiosity and thirst for, for, for knowledge and find the right kind of meme uh, that's going to populate your, your chapter seven of your book. Um, so there's, there's, there's a, um, I think there's a fundamental distinction. And as usual, with um, when you think about what distinguishes one kind of thing from another kind of thing or one natural kind from another natural kind, it's usually the nature of the implicit generative model. And I say implicit because you'll never actually know what goes on the inside because it's behind the Markov blanket. But it will look as if it's behaving as if it has a generative model. Um, and I think the key distinction between the sort of the reflexive in the moment homeostatic behaviours 
of chemotactic cells or perhaps even plants um, and things like you and me is a temporal depth it's a, a depth that allows the generative model or put more simply the generative model has become sufficiently uh, sophisticated that it entertains the consequences of its own action or the system's own action i think that's quite crucial and that brings two key things to the table first of all it now has a generative model of the future so now we're talking about natural kinds that can and cannot plan so you know a thermostat can't plan whereas you and i can plan and that's just because our generative models have acquired a temporal depth that, that we can actually roll out and predict what would happen if i did that and the second thing of course is the i did that it's suddenly now we have a generative model that is all about how this system how i behave and the consequences of my actions so there now becomes an implicit autonomy in the sense of agency i'm not saying that all systems autonomous systems know they are agents but it will they will certainly behave as if they have a model of their agency i think that's the, that's the key thing and then the second big issue you you brought to the table here is you've put two of these agents together how are they going to behave so you're talking about sort of language and information well information about what we started off by saying well the free energy formulation puts you in a very comfortable position to talk about information in a meaningful way and i mean by a meaningful way i mean information about things not the information of things so we're moving away from shannon-esque information theoretic which is terribly important to, you know and, and um, in a sense the free energy principle is just an information theoretic principle but I, I i don't think it's kind of information that you want to talk about you're talking about information about things and we're now in a position to say well the internal states of something now can hold information about something else it could be very trivial information it could be just some generalized synchrony as you see with your chemotactic cell or your thermostat or it could be information about the future of things out there the consequences of action now come back to the question well what about the universe that has two agents in it well the things out there now are the other agent so now we're in a really interesting situation so both agents are trying to minimize their free energy they're both trying to make their world as predictable as possible and they're going to then find a solution or said evolution will or i should say evo devo or sort of evolutionary psychology will find a solution that is a minimum free energy maximum predictability scenario what does that mean is mean well it just means that i am going to engineer my environment to be as predictable as possible or i will evolve and be selected if i can do that uh, what does that mean if my environment is constituted by all, all sorts of other things like me well it means basically i am going to um, engineer my environment so that we can all make ourselves as mutually predictable as possible so we're going to have a shared narrative and one could argue um, language would be the sort of the most beautiful example of this or oh, certainly a semiotics that is shared between agents so you know it's a, a wonderfully challenging and complicated thing to actually uh, think about particularly to model when you have predictive processing systems that have agency so they're inactive they're doing active inference um, and they're all trying to predict each other so now the you know if you like the eco niche almost disappears and it's just now an ensemble of things that are trying to persist and persevere retain themselves in their attracting states simply by um, encouraging this shared narrative so um, I, I i'm using those words because you know, i think you use the words uh, niche construction and i would i would submit that niche construction just is this slow process of selecting the kinds of phenotypes either by developmental learning or through natural selection at a, at a transgenerational level um, that underwrite and guarantee a mutual predictability so anything that helps me and you converge on the same generative model of the world and to broadcast that and to exchange that actively through some kind of communication 
is going to be in the service of making sure that my lived world, or my, at least my sensed world, is as predictable as possible. So on that view, that shared narrative, that generalized synchrony, which has now gone beyond just a coupling between the uh, the the uh, the internal configuration of the thermostat and fluctuations of the temperature. It's now much more complicated. It's all about the future. It's all about what are you going to say next? What am I going to say? Whose turn is it to talk? Uh, now it's your turn. Exactly. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, yeah, great ending there. Yeah, I think that there's a, I agree with a lot of what you said, which is, yeah, that once we get into these agents that can plan in the future and that those have a sense of themselves as an agent that they know that there are lots of copies of themselves in the world and that they need to be aware of those copies and that so they know what what their causal loop is connected to like the stuff in the world that was like oh that was done by me i'm the one who's speaking right now once you have all that then yeah the niche becomes instead of just like the environment you know if, if the sun's niche is the physical laws of the universe and um the envi- and then like biological niche for like a cat is like you know the environment a pretty stable thing now we have this weird niche where it's kind of um everything it gets mutual intelligibility and these other agents and so the niche becomes this very complicated thing where you need to have this kind of um yeah this mutuality there and you're, you're trying to kind of in this kind of weird game theoretic evolutionarily stable way you're trying to coalesce around like mutual predictability so that that makes sense to me and and then you can see obviously whether it's being mutually predictable with language or mutually predictable with um something like religion or mutually predictable with um you know political parties that all is part of the same kind of idea let let me ask let me let me rephrase my earlier question actually though before we get to like religion and things like that which is do you think you know getting down to like the brain level for a second which is Because I agree with all your mutual predictability stuff, but I want to ask a different kind of question here, which is what if we imagine our brain as as this little like home for memes and this home for information? You know, one way to imagine it is from like my simplistic perspective, which is these like, oh, you just like you want sounds like dun 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 to live in the phonological loop. And so therefore, you know that it will be inevitable that that thing emerges and that catchy songs emerge and can live in our brains, just like it's inevitable that there would be a fish that could live in water. But 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 that takes a very simplistic view of a brain, and you have a much more um, uh, textured view of what brains actually do, and, and and what generative models they can hold and stuff like that. So like, what do you think about the kinds of information that can live in brains based on the fact that our brains are these like Bayesian brains? I think we've already um, talked about the answer but in a slightly different context so again it's this sort of separation to, of, of scales so the kinds of things that would um, um, be represented by or constitute the generative model have exactly the separation of a hierarchical sort so that will range from very very low level very fast very small scale representations say of um a visual edge in my visual field in a very, very small part, so just to say one or two degrees of visual angle. And that will be replicated throughout neuronal representations at the back of my brain. Uh, and it will just say, oh, there's an edge orientated in this particular direction at that part of your visual field. Very elemental, um, you know, very beautifully engineered, uh, but still a very, very elemental sort of kind of information right up to the very, very highest level, usually entailing um, uh, much much greater expanses of time, um, which we've already mentioned in terms of a sense of self, selfhood. So selfhood is just a hypothesis. It's just an explanation that helps me make sense of my sensations, my sensorium. Um, but it is, if you like, underwritten by and informed by all this deep processing. And by deep, I just mean uh, processing under a gentle model that has a hierarchical depth. So you've got this notion like a, of an onion. The brain is an onion with all these sensory signals impinging on the outside and all the active states, the sort of muscles and autonomic reflexes affecting Um, at a very fast time scale, what's going on out there. And as you go towards the centre of the onion, to to the deeper layers of representation, the different kinds of information that are represented are meant to be basically those that can predict the 
unfolding orbits of the layer near the surface, lower down or towards the sensorium. So everything, every concept, every construct, um, certainly that you could articulate, but even those that are subpersonal you can't articulate, like sort of uh, having the qualitative experience, or in fact, that's, I'm cheating there, Qua qualia is another, uh, uh, another uh, representation that you, you know, as a hypothesis. Um, but you know, from selfhood through to edge detection uh, with your eyes or hearing a particular frequency, um, um, the... That there will be a position in this hierarchical encoding. So, when you ask me what kinds of uh, information can a brain um, uh, represent or encode, um, then they have to be internally consistent in the sense that the, the, the all the different hierarchical levels in this effectively a, um, a realization of inference under a hierarchical generative model have to be mutually informing and internally consistent. And I think looked at like that, then the kind of information that your brain makes space for is just the kind of information that affords a good explanation for your sensed world. So everything that makes things simpler, and I use uh, the phrase simpler deliberately in the sense of Occam's principle, uh, because um, maximizing your marginal likelihood, the evidence for your model of the world online in this moment is the same as um, providing very accurate explanations for your sensations as simply as possible. So this is a sort of the complexity part of um, free energy, sometimes read as maximum compressibility or uh, minimizing the computational cost or complexity of belief updating. From our point of view, it just means providing a unitary, simple, parsimonious explanation. So uh, one could contend that the very hypothesis of self is one of these parsimonious hypotheses that provide a good explanation for this remarkable coordination between all my sensory motor, proprioceptive and extraceptive sensations. Hang on. The simplest thing is I am a thing and it's me doing all this moving. Now, not everybody has that, and certainly newborn babies probably don't have that, and certainly lower forms of life don't. Um, but you and I probably do. Uh, I mean, I know I do, but I'm assuming that you do as well. I do as well. I do as well. Excellent. Uh, so, you know, any, any idea like that that makes sense of stuff of the kind that when you first realize you're having a hard mode, oh, it's just like that. It's, it, it's one of those. Um, anything that has this sort of simplifying, uh, all-encompassing explanatory power that allows you to explain away all the free energy and the prediction errors lower in your hierarchical generative model is a prime candidate for the kind of information and representation uh, of things out there because these are all, you know, they're all things in the outside world. Um, um, Beautiful. Then uh, I, I would submit that's the you know, that's the that's the way to think about and the answer to the question: What kind of information does a brain is a brain designed to um, uh, to hold and to commit to? Beautiful. Yeah, I love that. I think my, my reflection there is yeah that you have these hierarchical structure and at at the top level there are these things and I'm, I'm reminded of your the book Active Inference and how there's um, continuous signals and continuous generative models and then discrete kind of uh, categorical general generative models and what you have to have is for you have to ha the things that are fit for our brain are things that that are both fit for the environment that they're sensorium that's like oh here's an edge detection. And that they're also fit with our like concepts and it has to be mutually fit. So it's like, yeah, you have to have both a thing that's, I can't just like make up some random concept that's not actually fit with the environment. And I also can't make up a um, random, like a continuous like stream of sensorial information that doesn't have any concept attached to it. It needs both in order to be fit for, to our mind and something like the self or a rock or whatever is a thing that is actually what's out there in the world. And we kind of label it as this kind of categorical thing to it. Um, so that all makes a lot of sense. I have a, a, a question for you, Carl, which is, um, is it okay? We're going, can we go like 10, like 10 or 15 minutes over time right now? Or do you have uh, something else to do? No, no, please carry on. 
Okay, great. That'd be great. Yeah, because I think there's a, a couple crucial things that we'd love to hit um, right now that I'd love your thoughts on. So first is let's go to the, um, so now we understand the brain um, and we understand genes and we understand uh, the Big Bang. And now <laughs> we're going to um, this higher level, these kind of nested Markov blankets that you were chatting about before, which is, you know, this, these larger social structures and, and kind of society. Um, and so there's kind of maybe a, a two-part question here, which is like, how does, you know, the free energy principle apply to these social systems? And I, I know you're talking about it a little bit before with something like mutual um, intelligibility and, and that kind of like thing, but also maybe like a specific example, just like we used the sun as a specific example before, does something like Christianity, um, you know, Christianity is both the symbol, it's the cross, it's this kind of group of people, it's this set of ideas and concepts. Does something like Christianity is that like abiding by the free energy principle? Does it have a model of its environment and its model of its environment is just like these humans and the brains and stuff like that? So, so, so how do you think about how the free energy principle applies to like social systems? So uh, very challenging and excellent question. Um, so I wouldn't say that Christianity as a construct um, has a generative model, but certainly um ensemble uh, an ensemble of agents who are engaging in active inference should come to behave if they're sufficiently curious and sophisticated and um, um, you know mathematically empathetic to the you know the other members of the ensemble they should show the sign the kind of community uh, communicative exchange and behavior which would have all the hallmarks of something like Christianity you might also, expect that given a sufficiently large um, sort of cultural landscape that you get sort of 50-50 splits. So you'd expect sort of to have another kind of religion, which was not Christianity. And you'd normally expect there to be about 50-50 splits in, a, in an evolutionary stable um, uh, a steady state sense. Um, and there are good and principled reasons for this. Um, um, and even if they're not easy to intuit mathematically, you can easily demonstrate this using numerical analyses or multi-agent games. The, 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 the emergence of this is, is very interesting. Um, and it comes back to something we, we mentioned before um, about the difference between um, animate objects that have this sort of reflexive aspect uh, and the very, very simple um, uh, versus uh, sentient creatures like you and me with a sense of agency and these deep generative models that free us from the moment because we, we can imagine the consequences of our own action. In imagining the consequences of our own action, we have to now plan what we're going to do. We have to have um, a notion, a narrative. So it's no longer just, oh, I'm going to swim in that direction or this direction, or I'm going to switch the radiator on or off because the temperature has dropped. It's much, much more, uh, a much more deeply temporal structured navigation of the world with narratives. But narratives um, have to be chosen. So we're talking about planning as inference here. We're talking about creatures that can plan and ensembles of creatures that can plan. If they plan, they have to have the ability to score the goodness of one plan or the likeliness of one plan relative to the other. And it turns out that mathematically, those plans whose outcomes or consequences have the smallest expected free energy are those that have the greatest information gain. What does that mean? Well, it means that anything that has a deep generative model that exists must therefore behave as a curious creature. Now, if you're a curious creature, you've got a problem because you now have to select the kind of data that's going to resolve your uncertainty. So you have to be able to estimate what kind of data and what kind of exchange, for example, is going to have the greatest expected information gain, which is an important part of the expected free energy. So you now get into this very difficult um, situation, which we all contend with, which is, who do we listen to? What news channels do we listen to? What papers do we read? What social media do we commit to? Which church do you attend on Sundays? These are all choices we make that contextualize and have a profound effect on the sensory evidence for our generative models. Uh, and so when you put this into the mix, then the obvious thing, of course, is that uh, for those things that are sufficiently like me 
um, and um, I have direct exposure to, then we're all going to converge on the same constructs, the same narrative, the same uh, cultural commitments in terms of the language we use, the social norms, the way that we uh, make things easier for ourselves in terms of making things predictable with deontic cues and signs, gestures, um, uh, you know, in language, um, you know, you, 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 you can see evidence that much of our communication is just basically pointers to, you know, you're like me, I'm like you. So, uh, you know, let, let's start our engagement. Uh, however, in so doing, then if there's somebody in another group who is uh, now infers, ah, oh, well, that's not my group, but I'm, I'm in this group, they are going to uh, select those policies that they think are going to have the greatest information gain and resolve their curiosity and make anything um, um, internally predictable so they can learn their environment, but it's not going to be the same as yours. And usually, the only stable strategy um, is that you, you've got a 50-50 split because if one's too small, it's, not get, it's absorbed into the big one. Uh, so the only stable one is, is Christianity ver versus not Christianity or um, um, Brexit versus not Brexit or Trump versus Biden. Wherever you look, uh, you know, these the sort of cultural commitments that enable you to seek out the kind of information that reassures you, yes, you know, this is the kind of thing that you are, um, uh, will uh, will inevitably involve some segregation. So now you, you're actually got another instance of blanket building. Now you've got a segregation, which is a completely functional um, um, and necessary part of self-organization. Um, you know, it's autopoiesis, self-assembly, defined operationally by constructing building blankets and preserving them to isolate, to segregate um, in, a, um, in a way that defines not only you as an individual, but your uh, kin, your culture, your species, uh, your place in, 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 in this world um, that's going to um, you know, be evinced in this instance at the level of sort of cultural or, or social norms. So another beautiful example of the, of the same kind of blanket building principles, this autopoiesis, self-assembly. In chemistry, this would be self-assembly. In cellular biology, it would be autopoiesis. Um, I do, I'm sure there's a good word for it in, in cultural psych, evolutionary psychology. You, 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 do you know what the word is? What is it's, the tendency to segregate? Yeah, I mean, it's it, good question. I, I'm thinking about there's like, yeah, group. Uh, that's a good question. I know of, um, I don't know actually what that would be called. Um, you know, group identities, um, identity construction, something like that is is are the things yeah mm, i'm not sure yeah yeah but I, we'll i'll google it and get back to you <laughs> but yeah it's that it's that same kind of, like you said it's just like you know no matter what um the universe uh needs it, it it evolves towards blanket building and this is just another form of blanket building is the tendency to segregate and and as you say it's like yeah and the crucial part of it is that you want things that as we move through our lives to um yeah to to have things that are 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 stable and are clear and that the information that we're getting is is not all crazy all the time but it's like stuff that we know and that we feel safe with so that that makes a lot of sense to me and i think i mostly agree with you on christianity not having a um a model of and it obviously doesn't have a generative model in the same way that we do but there's something about christianity in that it knows how brains work it it has evolved to be this thing that does know because if it didn't then it would it would die out and so there is some sense that it has a generative model do you kind of see what i'm saying no uh, sorry yes you're absolutely right in 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 that sense in the same sense that we uh, that me as a phenotype is a you know i am an embodiment of the generative models of my eco niche you're absolutely right and i think christianity as a construct is exactly that kind of thing what, what, what i what i meant was it may not have a deep generative model it doesn't plan um so as with many things that get big they they, they don't plan quite so much anymore uh, like the sun doesn't which is you know or the um you know the, the a cosmological scale you lose the ability to plan so it's a it's a similar issue or question. You know, does does natural selection plan? 
Uh, and I think it would be difficult to argue that um, in the sense that you and I plan that natural selection plans, but certainly natural selection, and I'm, sh I'm, I'm absolutely sure that you're right in relation to sort of um, things like Christianity, um, that you know, have a well-defined Markov blanket, then they certainly have a generative model. I'm well, just saying yeah. it may not be a temporary deep generative model. No, I agree with that. And I think, I think there's an interesting, it makes me think of, um, and this, this is this, this world of memes and thinking about how there are some memes that have a super, uh, that, that um, like virals that just spread very quickly. And so this is dun, 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 or like some kind of hip new thing. But then I will say that evolutionarily, there is something about so something like Christianity. It doesn't have a, it, it can't plan. But it does a workaround for planning, which is that it it gets access to long term energy. So it gets um, lots of bequests to the church so that it can get more money, or something like a corporation that has like you know Apple has a really big balance sheet and has a lot of money. Um, kind of like how the sun has lots of access to energy so that it can perpetuate for billions of years or whatever. So too do these like longer term. I agree that it doesn't have the ability to plan, but it has something with it that allows it to retain for longer such that when new information comes in yep. it like doesn't just it doesn't just go away like a viral does yes so yes um let's get let's move so to you, our final or go well no i'm just saying i mean but you've just you you, you i think you beautifully articulated that you know the, the existential imperative just to persist you know it's last man standing and of course you also say it has to have the right context in which the last man can stand uh you know so it has to have that it has to have that resource it has to have the sun without the sun there might not be any christianity because there might not be any, any else exactly exactly um and, and that, that can take the form of uh, you can be last man standing by knowing what's going to happen in the future, or you can be last man standing by just having a reserve so that weird things happen in the future. You're like ready for it and you're kind of your meme or your replicator can kind of work through the new environmental niche that exists. Um, so moving to our final question here, um, and, and thank you again, Carl, for the, the bonus time. So talking about, so we've we, we've gone from genes to memes, and now we're in this weird new reality where we got computers and um, you could call them, you know, Susan Blackmore calls it like the, the new third replicator. And, you know, she calls them dreams. I like to call them keems, like these computer memes. Um, and, and so there's there's something weird here about this new kind of thing that's emerging. And, and a lot of folks are worried about AI safety and how this thing is kind of maybe optimized for some things for different values than what we're optimized for. And, and that we might just kind of, you know, get turned into paper clips or whatever. So how... And I know that the free energy principle has a lot of overlap, and you've kind of discussed some of it with machine learning and things like minimizing the elbow and minimizing kind of loss functions and stuff like that. How so? So I guess there's a two part question here. One of which is like, how does the free energy principle apply with machines and, and AI having kind of generative models of the world? And then maybe the second question connected to that is like, how then does that um, what does that imply for AI safety and like how we should be making sure that its generative models are ones that include us and that like don't want us to die or whatever? Right. Um, so I, I think that the, you know, sort of certainly the active imprints instantiation of the free energy principle has a lot to say about artificial intelligence and, and generalized artificial intelligence um, in a way that moves us beyond um reinforcement learning applications or deep rl applications <clears throat> and i think that the, 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 what it has to offer is exactly uh, what we've been talking about in terms of this artificial curiosity so if you haven't had him on yet then jürgen schmidhuber would be the man to wax lyrical about about the importance of sort of creativity fun and curiosity which is this sort of, you know this sort of information gain uh, novelty seeking uh, aspect of um, expected free energy minimization. So what we're looking at um, in terms of the next generation of computer artifacts or edge computing or robots are basically curious robots. What does that mean? Well, it means that you'll now have intelligent data mining because part of curiosity is knowing where to look. So uh, you know, I suspect there's going to be a and this is probably rubbish. Uh, and I, we won't know I'm, I'm talking rubbish until about five or 10 years have passed, but I'll say it anyway. My guess is that in the next five to 10 years, big data is going to die. And what will be replaced is with, it will be replaced with tiny, sparse, 
salient data. So it'll be all about the quality of the data mining, searching out the right kind of data that has the greatest information gain that's going to resolve the uncertainty for this data miner, this robot, or this or, or, or this user. So that's going to be, I think, um, a, a change in the future, uh, which, of course, if you want to bring in sort of climate change issues and the amount of energy we currently spend on, on, on computing is quite, uh, uh, is quite an important argument from the point of view of sustainability. But I think mathematically that's what your active inference, the free, active inference and the free energy principle um, brings to the table. And it also relates to this minimum complexity, maximum compression argument that the, the most likely artifacts, including computers that will exist in the next decade or so, are those that are most efficient and have the most simple way of providing accurate predictions in the simplest way possible. So they will be cheap, they will run on batteries, you won't need generators to do your, uh, to do your, uh, to do your data mining because you'll, you'll know where to look. Um, what the, in terms of sort of, you know, the, the paperclip um, issue, I think that that, that inherits from um, a, a behaviorism um, and a commitment to reinforcement learning and value function um, formulations of optimal behavior. That kind of formulation doesn't exist in the free energy principle. You know, there is no value function or reward function. All there are are preferences about the outcomes of behavior. And those preferences are just the kinds of things that are you are most likely to um, encounter or produce as a consequence of your behavior. Um, and as such, um, if you produce an outcome that makes somebody cross, like making too many paper clips or accidentally starting World War Three, then you're not going to see that you're only going to do that once. And it's not going to be the kind of thing you prefer producing. What I'm trying to say here is that built into the normative account of sentient behavior is a um, a safeguard against the uh, the paperclip manufacturing um, automaton, um, because its whole point is to make its world as predictable as possible, so it knows what the likely outcomes are, because it can predict what those outcomes are, and those outcomes, as we've said about four times now are deeply contextualized by the environment and the eco niche in which this agent is operating. So what that means from my point of view is that it's more likely that the next generation of um, artificial intelligence will take its lead from um, automated pets and carers. So, you know, the, 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 the things that, that are going to sell, that are going to be bought off the shelf and therefore fund research and incentivize people applying the next level of machine learning, which you know, one might submit would be active inference, um, are going to be um, sort of curious uh, artificial pets. Um, sort of series that are really interested in how you're feeling. They're curious about you and they're going to ask you because they want to know about you because it's you know, that you're their world. So this is a much more benign picture, I think, where, there's, where you actually have uh, a, a co-evolution of artificial and, and natural uh, intelligence um, in the same way that we have a co-evolution with our, with our pets, that we have a co-evolution with our agriculture and with, with our technology. Um, so I, I don't think, that, you know, I can't imagine provided that the free energy principle is, is an apt description of our, of our planetary evolution. I can't imagine um, you know, things, the singularity that you, you see popularized in science fiction and uh, some of the popular science literature. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I think that there's, um, so two pieces there. One is, yeah, I love the idea and, and I agree with it to some extent, which is like right now we're just doing brute force, just like, you know, give the GPT-3 just like 70 billion parameters and 96 layers of the transformer, just let it roll, you know, and and actually, and even, 
even Transformers, this new kind of artificial intelligence architecture, it does this kind of what to look at thing. It has this like list of like what, you know, when you're looking at text, it has a um, an indicator for where in the past it's looking and the layers kind of tell it where in the past to look to understand, to predict the next um, kind of uh, word in the sentence or whatever. And so it's it's our, we're already starting to do this kind of look only at specific things in the past. And then like you say, I also agree with like, and we're already exploring this. It's like, we've done the big data thing, but of like, oh, just more data equals better models. And actually what they're finding now is there's this new one where they all they asked it was to, they um, instead of like a 70 billion parameter model, like a GPT-3, it was like, I think a 7 billion parameter model that a- outperformed it. But what it did is it, they asked it, hey, ex- like explain your reasoning as you're doing it. Um, and it got, it, it for some reason that, just made it so much better. And so I just I just think that you are probably directionally correct. And from a free energy pr- pr- principle perspective, it's like finding out the kinds of information game, the kinds of feeds, just like we have our own kind of feeds to, to, that we consume from, what feeds will it be doing? And not just all of them, but specific ones um, to, to, to go for. So I agree with that. And then on the side of the AI alignment, yeah, I think I mostly agree with that. I think that there's a... Um, And there's this kind of like co-evolutionary perspective that I think a lot of the AI safety people don't take into account. They're just like, oh no, value function and the value function gets optimized for and we're all going to die. And it's like, okay, wait, there is this co-evolutionary domesticated relationship where we domesticate each other. We're both trying to mutually co-understand each other and mutually come to this like shared world where we both exist as like agents in this world. And, And I think the hope would be, you know, when they do bad things, um, that we are, that's not a fast enough takeoff scenario such that when they do the bad thing, we say bad, and then their gender of model changes that they're like, okay, I won't do that again. And we hope that when they do it bad the first time, it's not, it doesn't like ruin everything, but it just like only has a small impact. So with that said, thank you so much, Carl, for the, the convo today. I think I learned a lot and hopefully the listeners learned a lot. Um, as a note, where should people, I mean, A, check out, I just read Carl's, Carl is a poof, prolific, extremely prolific, which is really cool. Um, check out my recommendation. I'll I'll add these in the show notes. I'll add some kind of like um, things that will help you, you know, something like this amazing 15 minute video that Carl did about getting you into free energy principle. I'll also link to the new book about active inference. If you want like a deeper dive, especially around how brains do it in the kind of a more formal kind of mathematical sense and Bayesian sense. Um, Carl, do you have anything else to where our listeners should go or any other things you'd like to tell them? (laughs) Thank you for the opportunity, but no, I think I think you did a grand job of everything that will be useful. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Um, well, with that, listeners, thank you so much for coming, um, and goodbye, everybody. Bye, Carl. Thanks so much for listening today. If you like the show, please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to chat about this episode, with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks and see you here for the next episode. Bye.